<laughs> okay, you've got this album, uh, The Fantasy of Reality. Uh, it's uh, fascinating. I was listening to that, and uh, what interested me about it is some of the lyrics. Uh, for example, in It Never Ceases to Blow My Mind, you sing The Good and the True Are There to Find, and there's another track, uh, I think it's the first mm -hmm. track where you sing, is what we see reality. So I suppose my question is, is the searching for some kind of truth a central motif or concept for this record? Good question. Uh, is the search for uh, truth central to this? What's central to it is I wanted to lay out options. I didn't want to be the judge because I'm no judge of anything. It's not my job. But lay it out so others can look at it and go, oh, now that's reality to me. To somebody else, it's probably 180 degrees the other side. But so just maybe stimulate people. I mean, a lot of us are awake, of course. But stimulate those who need that little bit of extra go power or energy. Stimulate them into new thought and maybe making the next move toward what I call the all-encompassing one, I call the one who is love. Wow. Okay. Um, I mean, I, you know, if I may read from the blurb about this album, you know, it talks about this wonderful blending of uh, jazz, Delta Blues, Hawaiian avant-garde. Uh, mm -hmm. Cotton will astonish fans with his comeback, and I think you certainly have. It's a, it's a great record. Did you write all the material on this album? And if you did, what is your process for, for writing for writing songs? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, all of the music was written by me and probably 90% of the lyrics. Um, Randy Weimer works with me on lyrics on some of our songs. And Randy was our drummer in Moo, as well as a co-writer. Uh, and he has always been around. He and I started playing together back in uh, sophomore, his sophomore year in high school in my junior year. Uh, so getting to answer the part of the question of how, how this comes about, uh, to me, it's, it's um, music, writing music is, is more like a prayer than is any, anything else. It's reaching, reaching up and reaching beyond where you're capable uh, and make putting no limits again or judgments on it. It's a vertical process. To me, that's the closest I come to the the experience of a direct, what should I say, a direct joyous relationship with that which is the all. Are we talking about the divine? Are we talking God here? or You bet. You mm -hmm. bet. As I call God the one who is love. Okay. And so um, musically, I'm always striving to, to uh, you know, you're always trying to do out, outdo yourself and you need to outdo yourself because yourself's pretty small. So um, a lot of the music was written as far back as 2005. I shouldn't say a lot, excuse me. A few of the songs were started in 2005 when I first got back into recording. Yeah. And uh, so that's where it's at. And Randy and I, of course, sculpt the words. Um, the title always comes to me. Um, the, what the song's about comes to me. And then Randy helps uh, sculpt those into words. We're looking for a new language. Call it a tongue, if you like. Mm -hmm. Where we use words that everybody understands. Because we're all human. We're all in it together but words that are not weighted by emotion and past experiences that make us go, oh, my God, I don't want to hear that. So that's lyrically what we try to do. And so much of this album was done in later years here um, as far as sculpting the lyrical content. But the music was always there. We did some sweetening a couple of years ago. We finished this album about two years ago, I think. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, uh, again, according to the blurb, uh, it's, it's been a, a long time since you've released music. Uh, it says here 50 years. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, actually true, but why have we not heard more from you? 
back um, after uh, the Magic Band experiences, uh, and uh, we put together the group Moo. I don't know if you've heard any of that. Have you heard uh, any of that, Barry? I've heard of the band. I've not not heard uh, much yeah. of the stuff. No. So um, that band gave me the opportunity. That was about seventy-one. Yeah. Keep losing my AirPods. Sorry that. Mm -hmm. uh, about 71 through 75, um, the floodgates of creativity opened for me back then because in the Magic Band, you weren't, uh, you, you, your um, offerings were not even considered. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of bottle that up and I'd been writing for years before I joined the Magic Band. But so after Moo, uh, actually the later part of Moo, um, the one in the one who is love spoke to me very audibly and clearly and said, "It's time for you to start living, Jeff." And I'm going, "Okay, what does that mean?" I'm still a young guy. I've been on stage. I've gone to Europe. I've done fun things. Isn't that living? Yeah. Not but yet. as time went on, the answers came. And I was told, you know, it's time for you to start living, have a family, have a balanced life. And that was wonderful. That was the beginning of a 43-year marriage and, and three children, mm -hmm. two of which still live on Maui. The other one is back on the mainland. So um, my wife at the time and I did play occasionally. We did a few concerts. We did some nice clubs, hotels in Hawaii on several islands. Um, we would play for our own personal, for our friends. We would do uh, weddings and we would do funerals. And so um, there just wasn't a lot of recording. We did some recording here back actually in the 80s in George Benson's studio on, uh, in Lahaina, Maui. Uh, we, we had done some work in another studio. We loved the, the sound of the instrumentation, but the vocals weren't bright. So we went in Benson's studio and finished those four songs up, which have never been released, those particular recordings. But since then and on this album, there are some of those songs on, on the fantasy of reality. Right. So I always continued to write. You can't stop that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but as far as playing professionally, um, I, I struggled with this for 40-some years. Uh, I knew because I had that connection, that confidence that the voice I was listening to was for me and it's real and I need to listen to that if I want to ever go another step ahead or take the next step. And finally, uh, I got the word, it's time for you to do this. And as a consequence, we hooked up with uh, with uh, Snapper Madfish Records, Ian. Right. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey since then. Well, my my hope is that uh, uh, this album is one of many that's going to come out soon, really, because I'd love to hear more more material from you. Um, oh, thank you. Interestingly, uh, Cal Schenkel returns to contribute to some of the artwork of, of this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, was it difficult to get him on board uh, for this album? And of course, it, it provides a link with this album and, of course, Troutmask Trout Replica. Right. No, I wouldn't say it was difficult. Mm -hmm. It did take quite a bit of time because uh, there's quite a different vision from um, Hot Rats or some of uh, Frank Zappa's material then to Trout Mask Replica, and now to this album, which um, is quite a bit different, as you know. Yeah, I suppose it's... Uh, um, I mean, sticking with this new album, I mean, I love the, the, sure. the chiming guitar at the, the start of The Space Between Us. Uh, I was wondering mm. um, who you were singing about. What's the inspiration for this number? The Space Between Us is an interesting story. This title... And the, and the chorus itself, when the space between us all becomes a bridge, will I long for then and I always will, came about in 1971. We were already on the path way back then. Randy and I were always like, like this. 
and uh, we thought our thoughts were in harmony. Uh, we were at the same place at the same time, the same spiritual um, direction in our lives. So uh, the space between uh, those lyrics came about then and some of the music. And of course, that's what it's about. I mean, we are all cut from one cloth. We were created one. We are one humanity. So what happens to me happens to you, whether I'm aware of it or not, we are one. And likewise, when a blessing comes, when more life, life more abundantly comes into our life, it automatically goes through everyone. So what I, one, another way of saying it, as Randy would put it, he said, when the current rises, all boats rise. The current doesn't say, well, you don't deserve it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's basically what it is. We're all one anyway. So um, let's remember that and let's act upon that. Just encourage one another to be who we really are. And certainly listen to this record. Uh, uh, the, the, there's a very positive uh, feel to this music. But uh, um, I wanted to take you back, uh, go back a few years, if I may. It's uh, sure. I'm interested to know how you came to be invited to join the Captain Beefheart Magic Band. I mean, did you see you play with um, Meryl in the Exiles at all? Is that what? And you replaced Ry Cooder and Jerry McGee. I mean... There were, there were big shoes mm -hmm. to fill. Did you, did, you know, they must have been quite intimidating for you. Well, was it intimidating? No, not at that time. It wasn't. Um, the kind of music that the Magic Band was playing at that time is what I was looking for. Okay. Delft the blues, but progressive. And so musically, I didn't even have time to, uh, to be nervous or anything because I went straight from the Mojave Desert where we all had lived down to what's called Reseda, California. And we had this big, it was a, a house and then a bunch of um, uh, chicken pens, so to speak, open at one side. So that's where we did our, our rehearsals. And as soon as I got there, the next day, it's uh, we are writing and uh, learning uh, Trust Us from the Strictly Personal album. Yeah. So uh, that's how that started. I mean, um, uh, Merrill and the Exiles, were they, were they specifically an R&B band? No, Merrill and the Exiles, we were, um, what should I say, pop, I guess, pop and rock, um, pretty kind of teeny bopper, because I, you know, I was only 14 and a half when we made our first record. Wow. Oh. Um, but uh, to answer the second part of your question about uh, how I met Don and how that came about yeah. is Blues in a Bottle was our group at the time when uh, the Magic Band was playing around Lancaster and, and doing the um, Exposition Hall and different uh, as large of venues as we could find there. And so we would play together and um, Don you know, he was always looking for the next best musician he could put in the band. And uh, at that time, Doug Moon was playing with him. And Doug was fantastic. Great rhythm guitar player. And uh, but I know there were probably, um, what do you call them, personality issues, which there would be if Don Belit was involved. <laughs> so uh, uh, the first concert we did with him, you know, he was impressed with us because we were doing a few original songs. Now, at that time, they were doing more original, but they were doing Howlin' Wolf and, and other Muddy Waters and different groups. Uh, we had a few originals, but we did, at that time, we were doing the Yardbird stuff, real cutting-edge Yardbirds and stuff. Jeff Beck was one of my great inspirations at that time in my early days. And so Don came right up, right up in front while we're playing and, and looking at each of us and checking us out. And of course, what he did is he took John French, our drummer, who at that time was fronting, uh, singing for us. And at that time, now Blues in the Bottle was doing avant-garde uh, blues, okay. uh, rock, uh, some jazz. And um, so uh, John would also sing a really good Motown. He had a really black, 
really colored sounding voice. Wow. And so Don pulled him first because he needed a drummer. Okay. Okay. And so uh, John was there a year and I'm sure John said, Hey, you know, it's about time that we grab Jeff. And so uh, that's what happened. That's how I came in. Ah, okay. And uh, if I may, would you like me to shed a little light on who Blues in a Bottle was? Because people haven't heard any recordings. Please do. Okay. <clears throat> so at that time, uh, um, Bill Harkle wrote, Zuthorn Rolo was playing guitar with me. Mark Boston was playing bass. Mm -hmm. John French had been playing drums. Right. So this is the Trout Mask lineup. Wow, excellent. So so I got pulled in after John, then we pulled Bill in, and then we pulled mm -hmm. Mark in. And that's when the famous Trout Mask se sessions happened. Okay, okay. Um, there's a song, actually, uh, Beatles Bones and Smoking Stones. Uh, it's been described uh, as a, a hilarious swipe at the Beatles. Uh I'm just saying, in your opinion, what's your opinion of the Beatles at the time, and what's your opinion of them now? Uh, I loved the Beatles in 67 and 66 and 65 and 64. Always did, because they were songwriters. Well, they're a lot more than that, but they were really good songwriters, and I wanted to be a songwriter. Right. So I loved them then uh, in the... In the in, uh, the early uh, days in um, the Magic Band in Reseda, then when we started with uh, some of the songs that would be on Strictly Personal and on the uh, Mirror Man sessions. Uh, that was the time that I loved the Beatles even more. And Don, of course, he probably had a little attitude, as, as I've heard. And... Um, so he wrote that song kind of tongue in cheek. And I've heard that the Beatles weren't happy about it, but I don't know if there is any truth to that at all. I do know that they supported us and I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Um, not only them, of course, but uh, the most giant kudos go to, to uh, uh, Mr. John Peel. John Peel because yeah. he's the one who discovered us and, and pushed us in, in, in Europe. Yeah. But the Beatles, um, uh, as you probably recall, John Lennon, um, he did a photo, it was a, a promo, and, and uh, Kama Sutra Records, which we were on at the time, used that. And it had uh, uh, the bumper stickers from the first album, Safe as Milk, yeah. uh, behind him. So it said Safe as Milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, actually, is according to Wikipedia, I don't know how reliable Wikipedia is, but it says... John Lennon had two Safe as Milk promotional stickers on the cupboard doors at his home. And you've just confirmed that to be true. But, uh, of course, Frank Zappa did that wonderful We're Only In It For The Money uh, uh -huh. as well. But, um, right. and I, of course, some people have said that uh, Beatles Bones and Smoking Stones is a little bit of a strawberry, strawberry Fields feel to it. Oh. Was that intentional? Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was intentional. I doubt it. Mm. I don't think Don would do anything to mimic anybody else in any way possible. Mm. Although he did, it wasn't his intention. I don't think. Okay. Um, uh, Bob Krasnow was apparently responsible for the phasing and sort of reverberation effects on Strictly Personal. Mm -hmm. Uh, which apparently displeased um, um, uh, Captain Beefheart, of course. But sure. what, what was your opinion on, on the original mix of that album? Now, when we finished it in the studio, um, I liked it. I liked it. It was, it was good. Um, it wasn't what I would call stellar in any way. Um, but then we, we left really soon and went, we toured England and, and different places. And that's where we heard it. Um, I believe, uh, I don't have the detailed memory that some of the members do. I kind of take an overview and look down on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, were, uh, we were invited to the Rolling Stones' uh, new studios that they had just built. Their offices is actually what it was in somewhere in London. And um, 
we were going to preview the album. Uh, of course, they didn't show up. Those were some pretty dark, dingy days <laughs> uh, about those years. I guess that was 67, 68. But we played it, and I think that totally blew Don away because he had no idea that uh, uh, Robert Krasnow would uh, go psychedelic and uh, start chopping up. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, my take on it is I like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise, it would have been a, a very similar to um, uh, Mirror Man. Yeah. Not quite as rambling, because in Mirror Man, of course, we all we basically had was a, a, um, a framework to start from, not even necessarily to end. It was talking, there was a lot of ad lib done on that. Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, uh, I, I'm in interested to ask you. Of course, in the early days, you were represented by uh, Peter Meaden uh, here in the UK, who, who used to represent the Who, of course. But uh, but I'm also uh -huh. interested in what it was like working with him, and also, of course, as you mentioned, John Peel was an early champion of this mm -hmm. band. He used to have Safe as Milk on import and play it on his radio uh, um, uh -huh. shows, which was great as well. So how, do you, uh, how mm -hmm. did you find how did you find John Peel? John, a real friend, a real person in the business. And that was a really breath of fresh air. There wasn't a big ego in front of him, and you didn't have to please his ego. And he was just a good person. He took us everywhere. I mean, you know, we showed up at the airport. He brings us, uh, I think in those days, it was a 10 or a 15 pound sack of cereal. What was it called? It's from Europe. Um, pardon? Muesli, maybe it was muesli. Muesli, yes. Like and I was, yeah, <laughs> now I'm, I was grateful for that, me and John French, because John and I had to hang in the same flat okay. uh, while everybody was out doing other stuff. And we were hungry. So we had some cereal that we could eat. Okay. So John was one of those people who really put thought and care into his relationships. And likewise, many years later, I think in the 80s, I uh, contacted him. He was still living in Nantooth's Hole at the time. And he was so, so cordial and friendly. It was so wonderful. We just connected as people. And what are you doing? This is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I have nothing to say about John that would not be stellar. And how did you find Pete working with Peter Meaden? Unfortunately, I didn't even know Pete Meaden. Okay. I think I saw him once or twice, um, and he was kind of rushing around doing his thing, I think, trying to save save face or whatever, and that's all I knew about Peter. Okay. Um, the record mirror at the time uh, said... Uh, um, you're one of the best known American groups in Britain, quote, end quote. Um, were UK audiences at the time very different from US audiences in terms of how they received your music? So much so, Barry. Um, what I recall is when we opened up at Middle Earth and that place was packed, there were people out there, I think, several blocks wanting to get in. We opened up and uh, we didn't get that kind of response anywhere in, in the U.S. Uh, but uh, I remember that concert and it lasted, must have lasted two and a quarter hours because uh, somebody gave Don, he wanted a Pepsi or a soda or something and they gave him liquid LSD. So uh, the two nights, I think it was only about two nights before we left for Europe for that tour, John and I went to a music store and we looked up and we saw this beautiful older soprano straight soprano sax like one that john coltrane would have played and we said let's buy that for dawn now we were pretty poor but we came up with the 200 dollars, bought the horn took it home to woodland hills and the trout mask house and uh don didn't know what in from the next he never played horn he loved coltrane yeah uh, so I gave him his only two lessons that he ever had because I started playing horn in the fourth grade. That was way before guitar. Yeah. And uh, that's all he wanted. And that's yeah. all he needed. So we open up. He comes on and keeps that horn glued to the microphone. And, you know, two and a quarter hours later, we're done. 
So there was a lot of fun ad lib um, that that night. That, yeah. But the interesting thing I remember, now that was the psychedelic age. I saw thousands of people out there sitting down cross-legged on acid. Probably a lot of them were on acid. Mm -hmm. And they were also drinking, um, you know, I don't know what you call some kind of whiskey. Okay. So the two together, it's like they were mellow, but they were psycho mellow. <laughs> and they enjoyed the music as a consequence because that's what catalyzed us to just go. Yeah. Yeah. Now here in the U.S., it was like, you know, who are these guys? Uh, kind of like they quite didn't see us a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's an interesting uh, story, actually. Yeah. Uh, Robert, Robert White of the... Uh soft machine of course the soft machine recorded their first album in america the car supporting the Jimi hendrix experience uh -huh. robert white was exposed to a lot of frank zappa's music while he was in the states and it, I see. it changed the direction the soft machine took for their second third albums i think so he, uh -huh. he was influential but uh, yeah. uh going back to a uh, tramp must rest um, replica um, you guys lived together for eight months in this small rented house. Um, mm -hmm. uh, John French has described the situation as almost cult-like. Um, uh -huh. Can you shed some light on, on those what those sessions were, were like? Uh, and do you think great art comes from suffering? Oh, great question. It certainly can, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to. <laughs> Not always. So what happens is I'm... Um, uh, we moved to the Trout Mask House, the fire engine red living room where we lived, breathed, and slept sometimes and woke up the next morning with our guitar on, got up, stood up, and started playing again for the next day. So that's how that was. Um, ask me again, please, one part of the question. I cannot hold two. I have to start with one and then go to the next. Okay, well, um, I'm just asking you to describe the... Uh, the experiences of living in that house, which uh, uh, John French has described uh -huh. as cult-like. And what was it like living in that house at that time, creating this album? At that, By the time that came, it, there was stress beyond uh, anything that you can imagine. Gosh. Um, keep in mind, us four musicians, minus Don Valley had been very close friends. Three of the four of us had gone to high school together. We had played together in Blues in a Bottle and some of the other earlier groups that I, that I had, like uh, the Illusions. Um, there was another group, the Intruders. But at any rate, we were such good friends. There was never ego between any of us. And now that's, that can be interesting, as you know, with guitar players, especially you take two lead guitar players. Bill and I always just bounced off to one another. We just inspired one another. And of course, Mark on bass, who could ask for anything more? And John on drums. But we were just such close friends. But the whole situation changed uh, in the Trout Mass sessions because now um, the elder other two musicians, uh, Alex Snoffer, Alex St. Clair, Jerry Hanley had left the band. And so uh, Don was a seven years older than us. His character was formed, his personality. We were a bunch of young guys. Some of us were still almost coming down from the psychedelics. So you're wide open to just about anything. And so all of a sudden the tables turned and it got to the point where we could not confide in one another because we would be fearful that that person would break under Don's whatever it was he was using and tell him what was going on and then you would end up being the next um, under the light and being grilled by the um, Gestapo or whatever it is and that could last 8, 10, 12 hours and everybody else was supposed to chime in on his side and say what's the matter with you man so anyway it was very stressful um therefore we naturally for our own survival went straight to focus into the music and that saved us 
because when we were playing music together, there was no fear, no ego, none of that stuff was there. It was pure communication with one another. He imagine here's here's Mark in uh, in the eleven four time in the key of C doing chords and things. Uh, Bills is probably in seven four. Uh, in who knows what key I'm in five four, and of course John didn't get to play drums very often, because John was taking the parts that Don was uh, tinkering on the piano, trying to make sense of them, and write them down, and then give them to the musicians. And Don had no clue usually who was to play what. He didn't say this is for the bass man. And this is for Jeff. This is for Bill. No, he just blew it out. Went, hey, man, you know what to do with it, man. And so Bill, uh, John would go, okay, give us a part. And we'd work on it. So you can imagine. Now there's three of us playing. We're all in different time signatures, signatures, different key signatures. And we start the phrase together. And four beats later or whatever, usually four beats later, we end together. Though we're all in different time. So it took a real focus, uh, not in the mind, but a real focus. I call it a spiritual focus, maybe mm -hmm. a vertical focus, where you're feeling the other musicians. You're not even hearing them because what good does that do? You need to feel their breath, the breath of their, of their phrase. So you come together. So that that saved us for that eight or nine months. Wow. There was nothing else involved there. Uh, interesting hypothetical question. If mm -hmm. you hadn't have gone through those trout mask rep, uh, trap, sorry, trap mask replica sessions, uh, uh -huh. if you hadn't have gone through those, do you think you would have made more music, recorded more music in the seventies with the Magic Band? I think if if um, if we would have stuck more to the um, strictly personal music and the uh, of course uh, the Mirror Man sessions, uh, I don't see. Uh, put it this way: I don't know any other white band that could have uh, done anything near what we were doing. I think it would have been, uh, had we played at uh, Woodstock, I believe we were supposed to be at Woodstock, but Don was interested. We don't want to go get in the mud with a bunch of hippies. Right. So had we, uh, had we gone that direction, I think we would, have, we would have been at the top of the top of the heap for the time because there was nobody doing Delta Blues. I shouldn't say no one. Previous to us, um, Ry Cooter, in the Rising Suns, uh, they were they were the closest thing, as far as I'm concerned, to the to the real Delta Blues. Uh, and uh, but other than that, no. So when we went to Trout Mass, definitely that put us in the avant garde. We're uh, we're to rock what John Coltrane was to jazz. Let's get in there and explode all forms, all concepts of what jazz or rock is. It's just that we used rock instruments. Right. And um, I think there's a great place for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, what were the most um, what were the most challenging demands made of you recording this album? There were no challenging demands while recording the album, okay. because all we had to do is go in there. Uh, Frank turned on the machine, got his levels. We begin playing. Everything was one take, maybe two takes. I don't even remember three takes on anything. In fact, uh, I remember one part of the session where Frank is uh, in there at the controls and he nods out and goes to sleep while we're recording. He didn't even need to do anything. Mm -hmm. So it just went like that. Six and a half hours later, we're done. Uh, we got to hear some of it, a little of it. And we were stoked. We felt like we'd done what we were there to do because we put eight and a half, nine months of solid, uh, put our life into it for that amount of time. So there weren't any questions when we went in there. Uh, 
I'm interested. You know, it was strictly personal. Um, uh, it seems to draw more heavily on sort of Delta Blues. Uh, yes. You know, fairly conventional forms, really. I mean, what is the journey from strictly personal to the Trout Mask Replica? It's, uh, what was that journey like? Well, that journey happened pretty quick because as yeah. soon as we finished recording um, Trout Mask, and as you knew, there were some songs in there that were very stock, um, really, like you said, Delta Blues. Um, can't remember the titles right now. But then we started getting out there with um, uh, a few of the songs started getting out there. Trust Us. I love Trust Us because it gave us an opportunity in the middle to go from sort of a Delta Blues into a free form but melodic um, uh, song there in that part. And we were using or I was using feedback uh, to get that horn sound. Mm -hmm. So there's a sustained horn sound as Bill, uh, as, um, as not Bill, that was, uh, that was Alex. Alex was playing and he was going down the register and I was holding the horn harmony there. And so was the bass. Jerry Handley was even doing feedback there. So we begin at, at the, in that album to step out of the boundaries. So, um, I don't know how or why, but Trout Mask, the whole thing, was just totally, totally avant-garde, totally different. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I know why, too. Because, as you recall, Don was a harmonica player. And he was a darn good harmonica player, as far as I'm concerned. He could do those really high trills, really high sounds. But he couldn't play any other instrument. He'd never been schooled in anything. He didn't know one key from the next. In fact, when we did Trout Mask, he had very little concept of rhythm and where he should sing. In fact, when he did that studio, uh, studio work, see, we did our six and a half hour stint and we were done with Trout Mask. He came in for several days more, three or four days, John said, and laid the vocal. And so Don wanted um, Frank to put him in the, in the booth. And but he didn't want to hear any of the track. All he wanted to hear is just the leakage coming through. Very little like mouse or something in a in a fly's ear or something. And so um, most of that was sung and he wasn't even considering being in time with the track. So um, but to answer the, your question, I think the reason it went so different is because we bought a piano for Don, an upright grand piano. Of course, he didn't know anything about piano either. And he started just going, dink, 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 dink with his part. And he said, John, get this, man. Get this, man. I think he was using a little cassette recorder at the time. And then he started writing it out afterwards. So uh, that really changed the music. The phrasing uh, was no longer coming from a guitar not written on a guitar. So it was coming from little tinker tanks and things and pretty neat little jazz chords and things, discords. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think really tweaked the album and made the big difference in the music. Now, neither Mark nor Bill nor I, and I'm sure John, I can speak for him in this uh, place too. None of us had any concept that when we joined the band, that's what we were going to be doing. We all were going Delta Blues, man. There's nothing like it. This is where we want to be and bottleneck and all that. So that's basically how that happened. Oh, okay. Uh, one of my uh, subscribers, uh, Paul Ayers, uh, wants to ask you, um, uh, do you have a favorite Beefheart album from after your time with the band? And also, do you remember the last time you saw or spoke to Don Van Vliet? My favorite album, to be honest with you, I didn't follow after that. Okay. I have heard a little of this and a little of that. And there was one, I can't even tell you the name. You probably can. I'm sure Paul can. Mm -hmm. That um, sounds a lot like Trout Mask. But because there was not two guitars anymore, there was, uh, uh, what was it, Vibes or whatever. Yeah. Um, it isn't exactly the same. But I recall that was a nice album. It was clean. Um, yeah, it was a clean album and it was in time and really nice in that way. 
but it, uh, I don't believe I have heard anything since Trout Mask that really stretches the imagination and the musicians to the point where uh, you're out there. Mm-hmm. What was the second part now? Um, uh, uh, do you remember the last time you spoke or saw Don Van Vliet? Yeah, I sure do. This was probably 1986. Uh, 85, 86, um, I went back to the mainland, uh, Mojave Desert, Lancaster, where we were all from, and I was in a 7-Eleven, and all of a sudden, this guy comes up to me, it's Don, and he's he's smoking a Mersham pipe. Mm-hmm. He said, hey, man, it's really good to see you. What's going on? I told him, I said, oh, I'm living in Hawaii. I have a beautiful Hawaiian wife and kids, and I'm writing music. He says, I know what you're doing, man. I'm always keeping tabs on what you're doing. He says, see me? I'm smoking this pipe. He said, "Uh, John Wayne died from throat cancer from smoking. So I went, "I I better make a change here. So now I'm smoking a pipe. And that was it. Interesting story. Um, whose vocals are on the track? Uh, well, there's uh, interesting tracks, The Blimp and uh, Pina. Um, uh, whose vocals are, are they on those tracks? That's me, 100%. Oh, okay. okay. And also, um, I'm singing the chorus with Don in um, El Aguru. El Aguru. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I have the distinction I hear of being the only singer in the history of the Magic Band that was allowed to sing lead. Wow. Okay. Uh, how many Other takes of Pina did you have to do? How many takes? Yeah. Uh, one. Oh, it was first just for one take. Yeah, one take. Now, uh, let me speak to um, the blimp. Um. Fortunately, um, what also kept me alive and positive through that two and a half year period with the Magic Band, particularly the nine months of Trout Mask or whatever it was, is I was the scribe for all the lyrics. Wow. I didn't want the job. John took the job of being the musical uh, person in charge of meeting out the parts. I, I was I had begun writing music early on, because I'd been in, in, even in high school, I'd taken theory and all that, but I didn't want the job. But I always got Don's lyrics. I always understood what he was saying. And so I would spend sometimes eight to 10 hours in a given day, maybe three or four days out of the week, maybe five or six, eight to 10 hours in his bedroom with him and his girlfriend, with him spewing lyrics and I'd be there and I'd write them out and my job would be to write the correct words because there's many different words you could use or spellings for a particular word if you don't know what he's trying to say and so I would write all the lyrics and then I would I would get to uh, do theater and put my emotion into it and play it back to him the whole thing over and over and over and over and over. And so that was a great pastime positive for me. I wasn't under the gun. I was actually in a joyous state of connection with him and and the vision of the songs. So um, interesting thing is, is I would spend these days doing this and this would be all night long. Don wouldn't sleep. And then it would be nine in the morning and all of a sudden I hear the other musicians tuning up and starting to play. That means, Chef, you're supposed to be out there to play, but you didn't go to bed last night. So how are you going to do that? Well, I did. I did my best. And as John has said in some of his interviews, sometimes I wasn't fully present because it was daydream. Mm -hmm. So that was that part of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I only have one more question for you, uh, really, and that is: uh, um, uh, Did you work with uh, Frank Zappa? And do you? Do, and if so, do you have any interesting Frank Zappa stories? 
The only thing I ever did with Frank, I mean, he and I played together before at his house. We jammed. Um, I never worked for him, definitely. But getting back to the song, um, The Blimp. Mm -hmm. We had just finished the words to The Blimp. Don was just absolutely bubbling about it. He loved it. Okay. And he wanted uh, Frank to hear it. And Frank was in the studio somewhere in L.A., and so we called him up and uh, he said, Don says, you know, we want you to hear this. And so he said, just, just wait a minute, wait a minute. You probably hear that on the recording. He goes off and he puts on a piece by uh, the mothers. I think it was the bass and uh, another instrument. He puts that piece on and he says, go. So I just read it off and get into character. And so he records it through the phone and records it and that's how that came about myself yeah. and so that's my most fun frank zappa story really because um i didn't know he was going to do that and he says well that's a take let's put it on the album i gotta get back to work he said that's frank you gotta get back to work he's a serious guy yeah i, I, I get the impression that that's true but uh, anyway, yeah. I'd like to thank you for uh, doing this interview. Your wonderful album, I will put a purchasing link just below this video, and I would recommend anyone to go and buy it. It's a great record. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I know it's quite early where you are, so you can perhaps go and get some breakfast now. Well, actually, thank you. I'm going to have uh, a little drink of juice and go to the next interview. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll do that then. But thank you so much for uh, chatting with me, and uh, I wish I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay, bye bye. And thank, and thank you. I'm. It's really a pleasure uh, doing this with you, Barry. Okay. You take care. Aloha. All the best, mate. Bye bye. Bye bye.